All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 5. And we're going to talk about location, location, location is everything. That sounds like a real estate term, and it is. But spiritually speaking, I want to ask you as we go through Hebrews chapter 5, what's your spiritual proximity or location with the Lord? My wife and I used to go to the hills of North Carolina. Uh, her aunt, who lives in Tampa, has a second home up there, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful area. And believe it or not, the folks in the south like that, they head north for the hills during the summer months where it's a little cooler. Like snowbirds here in the north, we head south during the winter months. But uh, I want to talk about something far more important than real estate property. I want to talk about your spiritual proximity to the Lord. That's what Hebrews chapters 5, 6, and 7 are really all about. They develop the concept of the high priest. And you know we've been going through the book of Hebrews. That the author once again is going to compare and contrast. And at the end of the day, he's going to lift up and highly exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. That he is greater than anything that the Old Testament had to offer. He is indeed our high priest. And if you want to get close to the Father who's up in heaven, there's only one person that can take you into his presence and enable you to experience all the power that formed and created and sustains the universe. And he will enable you to have a relationship and experience his love like never before. So I just hope and pray as we're going to spend a brief few minutes together that you will be enabled to see from Scripture what is required in getting you up right up to the heart of God. And remember this as we start. John chapter 14 says, verse 6, one of the disciples seemingly raised his hand and said, Lord, what you're telling us seems way too good to be true. Are you sure that it's true that we can get to heaven someday? And Jesus looked at Thomas and he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. So that's what we're going to look at today, the great high priest. And probably the best definition of a high priest in the entire Bible is Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1. So let me just take a moment to read it. And it says in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 that every high priest taken from among men is ordained or appointed, kind of like certified. When you get a new car, you want that thing certified in case you have any troubles with it. Well, every high priest taken from among men was certified from men and things pertaining to God that he may both offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And of course, that's what Jesus Christ can do for you. You and I don't feel comfortable coming to God directly. We know ourselves way too much to do that. But Jesus Christ is the one who left heaven's glory, came to Bethlehem, born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life, and through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension back to heaven, he now sits at the Father's right hand. And he serves as a lawyer. He serves as an advocate, the Bible says, an attorney. And he will represent you to the Father, take you right into his presence, so you can experience his love, his resources, and his power. So we're going to talk about the high priest tonight. In chapters 1 and 2, Moses, or rather Jesus, was compared with the angels. And he's superior to the angels. We saw back there in those two chapters. Chapters 3 through 6, he's better than Moses. And now we're going to look at chapters 5 through 7 where he's better than the priesthood. So that's what's on the table in front of us this evening. And uh, a priest is one who represented fallen man before a holy God. You just can't rush right into God's presence. You remember the Old Testament? There was a high priest who once a year on the Day of Atonement, it was called in the book of Leviticus, he would actually go through the holy chamber. And then once a year he would go back into the Holy of Holies. And he would offer sacrifice on behalf of the nation of Israel, God's people. You might remember when Jesus was on the cross, according to Matthew's gospel, and when he cried out, it is finished, something miraculous, a number of things happened at that moment. But among many things is that, that veil in the temple, the Bible says, and, and some say that thing was so thick that horses couldn't pull it apart. It was a huge, tall veil. 
But at that precise moment when Jesus died on the cross and cried out, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost, that veil rent in half from top to bottom. It was a God thing. It was God's way of saying that Old Testament way of entering into the presence of God is over with. It's finished. And now you come right into my presence through the finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Aaron, if you see in chapter 5, verse 4, his name means light bringer. Of course, he was the one who was appointed, ordained by God in the Old Testament to be the high priest. It says in verse 4, No man takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Light bringer. He was the brother of Moses. You might remember when Moses was called, he had a speech impediment evidently, and he kind of argued with God, and God allowed him to have his brother Aaron go and speak on his behalf when they stood before Moses. So he was a Levite, as was Moses. They, they were Levites, and he was the first. Aaron was the first high priest. But if you know the history of the Levites, they had um, some question marks over their past. One in particular, I think it's uh, uh, Genesis chapter 34, Dinah, who was the brother, uh, one of the daughters, of, the daughter of Jacob, uh, the sister of uh, Reuben and, and Levi and, and uh, the, the 12 children of, of uh, Jacob. And she went up into Shechem and she was defiled up there by the Shechemites. And the two brothers got so angry at that that Levi and Simeon went up there and according to Genesis 49 verse 5, they became instruments of extreme cruelty. They took matters into their own hands and they basically annihilated the male Shechemites. And Jacob never forgot it, even when he was on his deathbed. So the Levites had a kind of a, a question mark over their past. You see what the author's doing here. He's saying the, that Aaron was a wonderful high priest, but remember this, he was just a man. As a matter of fact, the high priest like this would have to first offer sacrifice for their own sin before they went into the temple and offered on behalf of the people of God. So they were sinners, but they were came a man by the name of Jesus Christ, the God-man, the divine man. He lived a perfect, sinless, holy life. No questions marks over his past. He had a solid past. And it says in verse 5 of chapter 5 that uh, Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, capital S-O-N, today... I have begotten thee, I've raised you from the dead, and I've shown the world that I validate your finished work on that cross. That's what that verse is all about. So he was called the Son when he, the author compared him with the angels back in chapter 1, verse 5. He was referred to as the Son when the author was comparing him with Moses back in chapter 3. And here's a third occasion where he's comparing him with the high priest of the Old Testament and he says, the high priest in the Old Testament was great and wonderful and did his job, but he has no comparison with what my son, Jesus Christ, accomplished through his death, burial, resurrection. Now he's sitting at the Father's right hand, and he's making intercession for you and for me. So if you look at this chapter, chapter 5, you can break it down a couple different ways. But as I looked at it, I noticed in verses 1 through 6, Christ was selected. He was ordained by God to become a high priest. See, when he was here in his flesh, he was a prophet. All you have to do is read the gospel accounts, and you can see how he spoke the words of his father and made the people angry if the religious people were engaged in hypocrisy. He was a prophet. When he comes back again the second time, he's going to be a king. He's going to rule in his kingdom. But do you know what he's doing right now as you're watching this, as I'm sitting here? He was a prophet. He will be a king. But you know, he's a, he's a priest. Prophet, priest, and king. He's up in heaven right now, sitting at the Father's right hand, and he's making intercession for all who will come to him in faith. And if you come to him in faith, you can have prime spiritual real estate. Proximity. Right next to the Father. So he was selected. And it's interesting when you go through the gospel accounts, you find out 
that when Jesus was baptized and he began his public ministry, the first thing that happened is that the Father broke through from heaven and he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. In the middle of his ministry, kind of like out of nowhere, this would be Matthew chapter 12 and verse 18. During his public ministry, the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And right at the end of his ministry, just before he went to Calvary, he gathered Peter, James, and John, and they went up to a high mountain. And up on that high mountain, Moses and Elijah appeared. And Peter got all excited. And he said, let's build three tabernacles. And God the Father interrupted that conversation. And he said, no, Peter, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. I'm well pleased in him. And so the Jesus Christ, God the Father's Son, was selected in verses 1 and 6. And then he came into this earth, born in Bethlehem in a manger, grew up, began his public ministry around the age of 30, and through all of that, the Bible says in verse 8 especially, he had to learn obedience by the things which he suffered. Now that's in his humanity. A couple of verses earlier, it talks about in his flesh. My Savior had to go through the same struggles, trials, and difficulties that you go through, that I go through, so that he could understand your temptations. He could understand your trials. So that when you come to him, he can take you by the hand, he can take his righteous Father's hand, and he can be your mediator, your intercessor, bringing you right into proximity with God the Father who's up in heaven. So, he talks about Aaron in the first few verses of chapter 5. Then he talks about Christ, how he was selected, how he was perfected. But he's mentioned the name Melchizedek twice in this chapter. And in verses 6 and in verse 10. And if you were to go back to Genesis chapter 14, he's one of these mysterious figures. Abraham, you might remember, heard that his nephew Lot got in trouble. He was captured, and the king who captured him took him way up north. And so Abraham dialed up some of his select men. They armed themselves, and they went up there, and they rescued his nephew Lot. Isn't that interesting? That Lot always, uh, Abraham always loved his nephew Lot. And when he was coming back towards Salem, it wasn't Jerusalem yet, it was just called Salem, there was a priest that came out and acknowledged what Abraham had done. And Abraham offered him tithes, recognizing his position. And this Melchizedek figure, he blessed Abraham. Now that's interesting because the Bible speaks of him not having a past, and we don't know what really happened to him. He's just sort of a mysterious figure, but he sure does represent Christ. See, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi. So he's like the priesthood of Melchizedek, in that he has always been and he always will be. Now, this is where the, the last paragraph in chapter 5 of the book of Hebrews sort of takes a time out. If you look, the very last word in verse 10 is the name Melchizedek. And, and I love the way the author of Hebrews does this. This is a great teaching technique. He's about to develop the subject of Melchizedek. And by the way, he'll come back to it in chapter 6 and definitely chapter 7. I think the word Melchizedek is used about seven times in chapter 7. But before he gets there, he says, you know what? Here I've launched into talking to you about Melchizedek. He's mentioned in Genesis 14. He's mentioned in Psalm 110 and so forth. That's, you know, 2,000 years before Christ in Genesis, 1,000 years before Christ in the book of Psalms. And, you know... I've just got to take a time out and remind you, don't check out on me as we start developing this theme. Now, you understand he's talking to the Jewish people, having a tough time in the first century. Thus, the name Hebrews, the name of the book. And he says, look, I don't want you to grow dull of hearing what I'm about to tell you. And now he gives us some practical what-to-do information for people who live in our generation, because I believe... One of the plagues of the modern church is dullness of hearing the Word of God. So let's see what he has to say about it. And let's ask ourselves, 
How willing are we? When, do our ears perk up when someone starts talking about an Old Testament character like Melchizedek? Let's talk about that. I have a friend of mine. <laughs> it's my granddaughter. I only have one of them, and she means the world to me. But you know what? The word that's used for her, a little babe, is used right here in this paragraph. He talks in, in verse 13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And the word that's used for babe is not the classic one that's used in the New Testament that's used so often, pideon. No, it's, it's, it's this interesting word that means a, a, a person who is not yet at the age where they have the ability to, to talk. And it's a metaphor for being untaught, unskilled in the Word of God. Now, my little granddaughter is the cutest thing in the world. She's only four months old. She's not yet at that age where she's able to communicate and talk. That'll come in time. She'll be two years old soon, and she'll be, uh, you know, into all kinds of things. But right now, she's not able to speak. Now, what did the author mean when he talks about these people not being able to talk? Well, he's talking about people. Let me just give you some characteristics of people who are unskilled in the Word of God. You remember earlier in the book of uh, Hebrews, he talked about people who were uh, drifting, letting the things of God just drift right by. And then he talked about people who were doubting the Word of God. That was the people of Israel in the wilderness. They could have gone into the promised land earlier, but they doubted the things of God. Now, notice the progression or the digression. They're growing dull of hearing. They become like little babes. And so I want to talk, first of all, about the characteristics of, of a little babe. About a, what, four, five, six-month-old. They have no discernment. Have you noticed that? You lay a mouse trap around, and you better be careful. You better pick that mouse trap up, because they, guess what? They'll crawl over there to the mouse trap. They'll stick their finger on it. They have no discernment. They're the kind that can stick their finger on a hot stove. They have no discernment. And you know that when they become two years old and such, they will stick anything and everything in their mouth. So he's talking spiritually to people who are at this level. They've not really grown up in the Word of God. They have no development. Uh, Barna Research uh, took this poll from an average evangelical church, kind of like our church, Arlington Bible Fellowship. And let me ask you, how would you do if you were asked these kinds of questions? These, uh, the, these are the results that he came up with. 48% of the people in the average evangelical church here in America, 48% cannot name the four Gospels. That person is still a babe. They don't know the Word of God well enough to get to the place of proximity, close to the heart of God. They have become dull. This word that's used here said that you were on your way at one point when you first got saved. You were all excited. There was some intensity, but something happened, and you began to drift back. You started doubting. Now you're dull toward the Word. Barna went on to say that 52% can't name three of the four disciples. Could you? I see there's Peter and James, John. <laughs> How many of the disciples could you name if you were asked to name the 12 disciples of Jesus? 60% could not name five of the Ten Commandments. How about that? You understand that's why God gave you ten fingers, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Here's a pair of scissors. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Three fingers you hold up to your mouth. And thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Four fingers, here's the church, here are the steeples. Open up, what is it, open up the door and here's all the people. That's the fourth commandment, you're to honor the Lord's day. And number five, here's five fingers, you salute your parents, you're to honor your mother, mother and father and such. But 60%, the average evangelical churches cannot name five of the Ten Commandments. 50% thought Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. <laughs> Uh, I'm assuming you understand that Sodom and Gomorrah used to be cities down in the south edge of the Dead Sea. And because of their sinful activity, God came along and blew those cities off the map. You can go there today and see lava stones that remind you of that. 
61% thought the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. <laughs> so he wanted to tell you how you can be led into proximity, the heart of God right next to him. Because of your high priest, Jesus Christ, he's got to take a time out and say, you know what, I'd like to do that, but for so many people, they're going to check out on me when I mention the name Melchizedek. <laughs> have to use their brain a little bit, and they've grown dull of hearing. So those are the characteristics of a child. What are the characteristics of spiritual babyhood? Well, they can't digest solid foods. Verse 12 says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. The word strong there in the Greek is steros. We get the word steroid. I'd like to give you some steak, but like my four-year-old granddaughter, my daughter called us this week and said that uh, she made a big step. She went from pure milk, and now she's eating baby food out of the jar, apples and bananas and things like that. So uh, a, a spiritual babe cannot digest solid food. Milk is what Jesus did while he was here on earth. You know, Bethlehem, we get excited about Christmas. Little Jesus born in a manger, and that's good to get excited about. We get excited at Easter. He died on the cross. That's good to get excited about. But what is Jesus doing right now for you as I speak? Well, he's ascended back to heaven, sitting at the Father's right hand, enabling you to come right into his presence and experience all the power and the love of God. The meat is what he's doing for you up in heaven. Are you ready to digest the meat of God's word today? So one of the characteristics is they cannot digest solid foods. Another characteristic is that they cannot discern good from evil. I mean, maybe there's a, a I saw on, the, what was it, LinkedIn this week, a little clip from YouTube about uh, wherever it was, this mass meeting where people were, this one guy on the stage was just throwing his hands over people. And they were falling backward and, and starting shaking. And, and you know, if, if someone is not careful, Satan is so real. Satan is so powerful. Satan wants to deceive you. He wants to destroy you. And there are a lot of things out there that are going on in the name of Christ. But you'd better have some spiritual discernment and make sure that they're operating based according to God's word. So they cannot discern good from bad according to verse 14. They'll touch the stove, as we said already. They'll put things in their mouth that they shouldn't put in their mouth. They cannot disciple people. And I think this is really where the author wants to get to. I'm going to read verse 12 again. It says, When for the time they ought to be teachers, they have need that one teach them again. Don't kid yourself, please, this afternoon or this evening, whenever you're watching this. If you're not discipling other people for Jesus Christ, you're still a spiritual babe. God has called all of us to find someone who knows less about the Bible than we do. And if you'll pray and ask God to help you find someone, maybe it's somebody in your own family. Dads, maybe it's your own children. But God help us to find at least one person that when God teaches us his word, we can then pour into them. You know what Matthew chapter 28 says? Just before Jesus went back to heaven, he looked at his disciples and he said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always even unto the end of the age. God help us to be in the business of discipling other people for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sometimes my granddaughter will do that. You set her down in front of you and you smile at her and she'll just start crying and crying and crying. Could it be that uh, we're not interested in helping others as we're so consumed with the interest of ourselves? Well, those are the characteristics of immaturity. Secondly, what causes immaturity? There's an interesting verse here. I want you to look at it with me, verse 11. We have many things to say, and they're difficult to explain. They're hard to be uttered. Here's the reason why. Seeing ye are dull of hearing. And the Greek here is you've become. You lapsed back into this. 
instead of taking what you heard and exercising, using it, disseminating, giving it out to somebody else, you kept it to yourself. And it has spiritual consequences. It's caused you to grow dull. You're not interested in learning anything else because you haven't done with what God has already entrusted to you. Dull of hearing is interesting. It literally means in the Greek there's no push, there's no drive, there's no effort, there's no intensity, no desire. Just sort of blah, like a four-year-old infant. And listen, we all go through that babyhood state as a Christian. I'm not against that. I remember how it took me a while to grow up. And I'm still growing, please. But what this is about is someone who's been in your church for 30, 40 years. And they're still in this infantile stage. Same word is used in the next chapter. In, in chapter 6, verse 12, he says, That you be not slothful. There it is. You know what a sloth is? It's an animal. I think they live in Australia. It takes them forever to do anything. That's what this word, dull of hearing, means. You've lost energy. Slothful. He says, I don't want you to be slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience have inherited the promises of God. Well, we can also learn, not from the same word that's used and translated into slothfulness, but we can also learn from the opposite word that was used, and it's used in chapter 6, verse 11. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence. There it is. That's the word spude or spadazzo. You hear the word speed. It takes effort. It takes energy. It takes desire. It takes intensity. And if you really want to grow up in Jesus Christ, the author of Hebrews is asking you, would you like to have that proximity next to the heart of God? Jesus can take you there. You're going to have to grow up. You're going to have to get out of bed when the alarm clock goes off and read your Bible and pray. Meditate on the Word of God. We'll get to that in a moment because we're going to get to the cure for all of this. We're giving you the characteristics of immaturity. We're giving you the causes of immaturity. And we want to give you now the cure for immaturity. I don't want to leave you there, but like you go to a doctor and say, Doctor, what's wrong with me? I have no interest. I have no desire to grow spiritually. What should I do? That's a great question. I'd like to have that prime real estate. How do I get it? That's a great question. Glad you asked. Look at verses 11 and 12. He says, I want you to grow strong in the word. Of whom we have many things to say, hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. For when for the time you should be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracle of God. And you've become such as have need of milk, not strong meat. You know, we ought to be growing strong in the word of God. How do you do that? Well, obviously, first of all, you start reading it. When the Lord saved me, 17 years old, 1978 in February, I could hardly read. But God placed in my heart this desire to go home, close the bedroom door, and I just started reading tons and tons and tons. and Just read it. Just read it. Not for intellectual purposes or to tell somebody how much you've read, but let God speak to your heart. I mean, God was speaking to my heart back in those days. And I discovered... That reading the Bible is the first step. Okay? What you do having read the Bible, and I'm thankful I had a wonderful youth leader. He gave me a little booklet. I didn't know at the time. It was basically a commentary on what I read. So I'd read the Word of God. Then I'd read this little commentary. I said, hmm, that makes sense. I'd go back and read the Word again. What I didn't understand is that uh, God calls us to be like sheep. And did you know that sheep are very special animals? They don't have just one stomach. But they're part of the family, part of an animal family that ruminates, which means they have more than one stomach to digest what they take in. As a matter of fact, they can have up to four chambers in their stomach. Now think about that for a minute. <laughs> they will go out early in the morning, and they'll kill two stones with, uh, with uh, one rock. They'll kill, how's that go? Two birds with one stone. I'm glad Eric's over here keeping me straight. Why they get up in the morning and go out early in the morning and eat the grass is because there's dew on the grass. Think about that for just a moment. Much of their water comes from the dew that's on the grass. But usually around noon when the sun is at its zenith, that's high point, 
they'll go find a place of shade and they'll sit out. And if you look carefully at a sheep, it'll start chewing its cud. Why do they do that? Because what they took in in the morning comes back up. That's called rumination. And they just go over it, and they go over it, and they go over it, and they go. Then it goes to a second chamber and a third chamber, and after a while it becomes a part of them. Now, there's something there, if you stop and think about it long enough. I personally believe that's what the word meditation is all about. God told Joshua, he said, Joshua, now before you go in and take the promised land, here's what I want you to do. <laughs> This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. This is Joshua 1.8. But thou shalt meditate in it day and night to do all that I've commanded you to do. Meditate in my word day and night. Then you will be prosperous. Then you'll find good success. You look at the book of Psalms. You know how it opens? Blessed is the man that walks not in the congregation. Counsel of the ungodly stands in the way of sinners, sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. God wants us to read his word. And God wants his word to get into our hearts. Again, not just so you can be more intellectual than someone else, but that you can get close to the heart of God. So this family has four chambers. So that they can chew what they receive. Now, we grow strong in God's word. But notice he goes on to say, I don't want you just to grow strong. I want you to grow skillful with it. See, this is the second stage. person grows up. They become skillful. Uh, for everyone that uh, uses milk is unskillful. Literally, literally ignorant in the word of righteousness. For he is just a babe. So, you know what it means to be skillful, don't you? I take my car to an auto mechanic, mechanic here in town, and man, I hardly know anything about auto mechanic things, but boy, he does. That's because he's given himself to it. A person can play the piano in a wonderful way. You want to know how they got that way? They've done it for several years. A person can fly, fly an airplane. You know how they got to be that way? They've done it for years. You know, after a while... You start reading God's Word and meditating on God's Word. It becomes a part of you. God will enable you like He did with David who took that slingshot. He was skillful with it because He used it all the time. And He killed a giant with it. Well, we grow strong in the Word. We grow skillful in the Word. And notice, this is very interesting. God wants us to even become sensitive to His Word. Verse 14 says, Strong meat belongs to those who are of full age or mature. They've grown up in the Word of God. Even those who by habit of use have their senses, and the next word, exercise, is the word in the Greek for gymnasium. They've exercised their senses. You know, your five senses, hearing, sight, taste, touch. You know, as I grow in the Lord, and I start with drinking milk, I graduate to strong meat, I even become sensitive and I can hear the voice of God speaking to my heart, maybe telling me that something that someone else can do, I can't do. Are you sensitive that way to the Holy Spirit's leading in your life? Here are some verses when Peter wrote his, his, uh, his little epistle, the first epistle. He says, look, you ought to dive into the Word of God every day just like my little granddaughter. <laughs> when she's crying and she's hungry, there's only one thing she wants. She wants a bottle of milk. And Peter said, I want you to desire the sincere, the milk of, of God's Word that same way. I'll tell you, one day, when I had to make a major decision in my dorm room, I got a phone call, and the phone was outside of my door. I lived in a house dorm at that time. About 12 of us lived there. And the phone happened to be right outside my little single bedroom door. And I picked up that phone and a man asked me if I wanted to work off campus. And I knew that would make a major change in my life. I said, sir, let me pray about that. I closed the door behind me. I got beside my little bed there in my dorm room. And I opened up my Bible, just wherever it fell open. <laughs> 
And I put my finger on the verse in front of me. And it was open to Psalm 42, verse 1. Psalm 42, verse 1 says, As the heart, the deer, pants after the water brook, so pants my soul after thee, O God. And I told God that day, I said, Lord, I know if I make this decision, it's going to change my life. Would you give me your wisdom on this decision? Now, is God's word like milk to you to a four-month-old baby? (laughs) Is God's word to you like water to a deer who's thirsty and panting? Is that how you get out of bed in the morning? Remember Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, when he was being tempted, told the devil, he said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I tell you, stop to think about it. God's word is like a four-course meal. It can take care and satisfy all of your needs. As a matter of fact, for dessert, he'll even give you honey. (laughs) Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You know, I was doing a little research this week. And I was reading about how the Hebrews did it back in their day. And several years ago, when the Jewish children started to learn, like we would call it first and second grade, somewhere in through there, maybe even younger, this article that I read said that a rabbi would issue his little students a clean slate. And the first thing he did in that classroom, on a clean slate, he would pour honey on all four sides of the slate. Then he would ask the children to take their finger and dip it in that honey and put it in their mouths. And then he said, may the words of God be like honey on your tongue. Now, I'm sure they never forgot that. I wonder, is that what God's Word means to you today? See, we started out by talking about location, location, location is everything. I don't know about you, but if I could have a place right next to the heart of God, (laughs) sign me up for that. And so many people have this interest to do it. Maybe they have this desire to do it. But that's all it is, is just a desire. They don't take it to another level. Like a person going to the gymnasium. You know how a basketball player becomes a great basketball player? They spend lots of time in secret. And God says if you want to get close and stay close to the heart of God, when I raise subjects like Melchizedek, you ought to sit up and pay attention and, and, and listen when I'm talking about Genesis 14 and Abraham and Lot and Melchizedek. Because if you'll listen, my word will become for you like steak like water, like milk, and like honey, and there's nothing like it. So that's what we want for you, that you will enter into God's presence and stay close to the heart of God. Well, Father, thank you for our time we've had together in Hebrews chapter 5. And again, this is meant to just to be an overview. We can certainly slow down and develop this, but just want to uh, get glean just uh, off the surface here what you're, you're, you have for us today. And I pray, God, in this uh, day of uncertainty, when there's so many things that are happening all around us, that you just bring us back to your word, back close to the heart of God, because we know there at the heart of God, all of our needs, all of our resources will be met. So we thank you for our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's come to this earth. He understands our side of things, his humanity. He went through it all. But we thank you for his deity. As God, he was raised from the dead and now sits at your right hand. And he's there as our go-between, our mediator. Help us to take full advantage and stay near to the heart of God. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for listening. And hopefully here real soon we'll be able to get back together again. See ya.